Thank you for having me this evening. I'm excited to talk to the Digital Marketing Collective about lifetime value because it is the most important metric. As the title of this presentation hints at, it is the only metric that really matters, and that's because it is a net metric that has unrivaled ROI because it's useful across the organization. So while this is a digital marketing focused organization and one of the most vibrant communities in the Silicon Slopes right now, what you will do with lifetime value is just as useful to your sales team, just as useful to your product team, and just as useful to your CX team. And that's very rare for any metric to be this useful across the entire organization. And because it is a net metric, it captures the effects of most of the other things that you're currently measuring and quantifying right now as marketers. I'm Luciano Pesci, founder and CEO of Imperitas. We're a team of economists and data scientists delivering customer lifetime value, business intelligence, so our customers can beat their competitors and build a market empire. I'm also the founder and director of the Utah Community Research Group at the University of Utah, where I teach microeconomics, data science, applied research, and American economic history. And I'm going to bring both of these expertise to bear as I make the case for lifetime value today. But let's do a quick poll before I get started. Raise your hand if you currently have access to a lifetime metric in your existing role. Okay. Now keep them raised if you are confident in its accuracy. And when I say accuracy, I mean to within 5%. So if this is $100, you feel very confident that the metric you have captures that real value of $100. Okay. Now, if you follow this link, and I will do this often throughout the presentation tonight, if you go to the bottom left, you will see a source that has a link to other material. It's not my material. Sometimes it is my material but it's other material that I'm bringing into this presentation this evening. Go there and read about this. Right now, 40-ish percent of organizations say they have a lifetime value. Very few of them have confidence in it, just like we proved here right now. But let's look ahead to where we will end up this evening. So this equation is a mathematical quantification of lifetime value. You will not be able to perfectly copy and paste this because you may in some cases have the same data and in other cases you may not. Instead, what it is meant to show you is that all of lifetime value can be broken down into three component pieces. The first is the monetary value, the second is the non-monetary value, and the third is some future value component that you've yet to realize. If you click on that link in the slide deck that's been provided, it will take you to a document that is online right now available for you to go through. It has all the definitions of this equation, all the parameters, the values of those parameters, the variables, definitions of those variables, and how each of these three components was calculated to create the overall lifetime value for the Digital Marketing Collective's annual event that just happened last month in August. But tonight's presentation can be broken out itself into three parts. The first is going to be defining lifetime value and all of its components. So I mentioned those three components, monetary, non-monetary, future value. I'm gonna define those in detail. Then I'm gonna go into the use cases of lifetime value and its common pitfalls. How do you as marketers or how do you as people in an organization outside of marketing use lifetime value? What are some really good examples of wins that have happened around this metric? And then what are the common pitfalls that as you try to replicate that success that you are likely to encounter? And then the third and final portion, and this is where we're gonna get into the real meat of the presentation, is a fully worked example for DMC's annual event. So let's start with defining lifetime value. There are differing definitions of lifetime value. So if you were at DMC last year, 2017, Google co-presenting said this, that lifetime value was a way to understand a customer's revenue potential. And there's a reason that word is in red, revenue, because that is one of the two typical definitions of lifetime value, that it is a revenue-based metric. The second and more accurate, in my opinion, definition of lifetime value is that it is a measure of profit that you can expect to generate from a customer over the entire time that they do business with you. And so if you go to that source in the bottom left, it will take you to a Forbes article where that case is made that it is profit that needs to be the focus, not revenue. Now, there are also differing definitions of lifetime value. Another common term that is used is customer lifetime value. And if you actually go look at Google search trends, which is what this video is showing, you will see that they move almost perfectly together. Lifetime value and customer lifetime value are highly, highly correlated to search terms. Now, Utah, interestingly, is in the top five of search regions, but 80%, regardless of the region, of what is being searched for when these terms are used is a way to calculate the actual metric. So equations, calculations, definitions, cheat sheets, things that will help you create this actual metric. And that's why I've structured this presentation the way I have this evening. But I'm an economist, so let me give you my formal economic definition of lifetime value. 
It is the total value of a customer over the lifetime of their relationship with your brand from initial awareness all the way to death. And the reason that I'm adding this additional component to the definition about from awareness to death is because death is not churn. So churn is something we will talk about a lot tonight, but churn can be undone. It's called rebounding. So they may churn out once and then come back and purchase again. Death means that they literally never purchase from you ever again. And so if, if the definition is too narrow, like it is often done with lifetime value, it's not uncommon to forecast only out one year or two year. That's fine. There are simplifying assumptions that have to often be made, but ultimately you should be working towards a goal of understanding the total value across the entire life with your brand. Now, I mentioned that it can be measured in either revenue or profit. You ultimately need to get to a place where you are measuring lifetime value in terms of profit. And I'll get to why that's important with cost accounting shortly. But whether you take the revenue route or the profit route, keep in mind that you are trying to measure one of the most difficult things in economics, which is people's willingness to pay. Ultimately, lifetime value comes down to the amount of money that the customer gives to your brand. And that is notoriously difficult to measure and quantify because even if the customer wants to be honest with you, and there's an incentive in some cases for them to not be. So if you just go to a customer and you ask, how much are you willing to pay? There is an incentive because they know that this is going to be tied to what they actually ultimately pay to tell you less than they really want or what they're willing to pay. And so that's called their reservation price, the absolute most that they'd be willing to pay. So even if you take away that incentive to not be forthcoming with the total amount, in economics, it has been well demonstrated that willingness to pay and willingness to accept are not the same thing. So let me quickly define those. Willingness to pay is what you would pay me if I gave you something. So if I'm selling a water bottle, your willingness to pay is the amount of money you would give me to get the water bottle. Now that you have the water bottle, if I ask to sell it back to me, which is willingness to accept, how much do you need to sell the water back to me? You might think that it's the exact same amount. Actually, it's not. I would have to pay you more to get that water bottle back than you paid me to get it. And so willingness to pay and willingness to accept are something that have been really well studied in economics for 40 years now. And willingness to accept is always higher. And so that complicates things. That means that if we are doing willingness to pay analysis, uh, the way in which we frame this as a transaction is very important to the kind of value that we will ultimately be able to derive. And you're doing this over time. It's not just about the willingness to pay today. It's about the willingness to pay ever and in the future, and as the product changes, and all of that gets very complicated. And this is why lifetime value has three key components. Total value means capturing everything in the customer journey at every single touch point. And it can be broken down into three components, a monetary value, a non-monetary value, which is still measured in dollars. And both of those, monetary and non-monetary, are historical in nature. It's what has happened up to this point. And then there is a future component, which is going to have a monetary and a non-monetary addition. So let's go through each of these three individually. The monetary component is a historical contribution to lifetime value, and it's usually modeled with the RFM approach. So if you were at DMC's annual event last month and you were paying attention between sessions, there was a game happening on the screen that asked you to tweet at us answers to specific questions in order to win a prize, which was a gladius, a sword. And in that game, we asked, what does RFM stand for? Many people got it right. The link down here in the bottom left will take you to an explanation, but it is recency, frequency, and monetary value. And this is a strictly historical approach. You just look at what people have purchased from you in the past and how often and at what interval. And from that, you get some calculation of lifetime value. Its strength is that it's easy to calculate because often everybody has access to purchase data. However, a weakness is that it doesn't include anything except for actual transactions. No non-monetary component, no future value component. You can use it to do some forecasting. If you do that, you need to control for seasonality. So if you're an e-commerce site, for example, it is not uncommon for 75% of your revenue to happen in the last quarter of the year. That means that if you take the RFM approach, if you did that in March or you did that in December, you're going to get very different results because of the recency component. And so seasonality needs to be worked into these models, but it should also control for other things like change point analysis. When a new product comes on the market, when a new competitor comes into the market, when there are shifts in preferences on the consumer side, all of those things mean that you can't just treat the past as one uniform trend. In addition to that monetary component, it is quite common 
for non-monetary contributions to have a very high level of impact on lifetime value. Most specifically, this comes down to willingness to recommend or actual recommendations. So net promoter score is how this is typically modeled. And net promoter score is a survey-based question type. If you go to the bottom left and you see that source, you'll go to the original HBR article, the one number you need to grow. I would argue that that is not correct because NPS is a subcomponent of lifetime value but it is a good measure of the likelihood of growth because people are out there talking about your brand positively overall. So if you don't have NPS at your organization right now, it is based on the idea that word of mouth is still the most important marketing channel. And this has been well demonstrated by the work that Imperitas has done. It doesn't matter what vertical we're looking at. It doesn't matter what organization we're looking at. When we start to dig into the effectiveness of marketing channels, what we find is that word of mouth still drives more of the behavior than anything else. And so in that way, NPS is a good proxy for what's really driving additional growth. But it is about growth of new individuals because the question asks on a zero to 10 point scale, so 11 points overall, how likely are you to recommend this brand to your network? Anyone who is a zero to six is considered a detractor. They're not helping your brand. They're out there actively hurting your brand. Anyone that's a seven or eight is a neutral or a passive. They really don't add anything, but they don't take away. And then you look at those who are nines and tens. These are out there actively promoting. And the idea is you take the proportion of nine and tens and you subtract away the proportion of zero to sixes and you get your net promoter score. So this can be negative, but as a proxy metric, it, it has done very well as a guide for growing new individual customers. Ideally, you would be able to track a recommendation observationally. So if I made a recommendation to my friend, you would have a way to track that that recommendation came from me because this is attitudinal and we'll get into data origin in a moment, but attitudinal data doesn't show you what has actually happened. It shows you what's likely to happen. But NPS has been around now for many years. It's been well established as a good metric, but it's not the single silver bullet that some people like to believe. NPS has dethroned in some ways the other metric that was often guiding decision-making, which was overall satisfaction. And it has been product managers within organizations who've brought this metric back into vogue. So product managers are often more concerned with the experience of the current customers rather than the idea of growing the business through referrals. And the lag in time between something like a new product release and the feedback they get is very, very short. And so they have often gone back to overall satisfaction as a gauge to figure out whether more revenue is going to come in because they release some new component in the software or some new product feature or some new product. And so overall satisfaction is having this renaissance moment. I encourage you to look at both. When we dig into the model that was made for DMC, you will see that we do use both. And then there's the future value component. To this point, both the monetary and non-monetary components have been backwards looking. It's like driving down the road, looking in a rear view mirror. What is going to happen in the future? This is difficult because it involves forecasting and it involves both a future monetary and a future non-monetary component. This is where the idea of consumer surplus from economics comes in. It's very important that you figure out how to capture that additional value above what someone's currently paying that they would pay you if you could figure out how to capture it. And that's the definition of consumer surplus. And in the future, you actually do have the ability to make some of those changes to capture more of that value that they'd be willing to pay. Now, churn and rebounding affect this a lot. So I mentioned earlier, Churn is when they stop buying from you. Rebounding is when after they've stopped buying from you, they buy again. And it is very common when you start to look into some of this data over a long enough timeline with a brand that you have somebody that say, for example, with Netflix unsubscribes. And then six months later, they realize, you know what? They're not so happy without Netflix. So they subscribe again. So they churned at one point, but they weren't dead to the brand. They came back, they rebounded. And in some cases in data sets, we have seen rebounding happen three, four, five times. Often that rebounding is being caused, the churn that leads to the rebounding is being caused by poor customer experience. So someone has an issue, they call the brand, the brand fumbles, they unsubscribe or they stop purchasing. A few months later, they decide to give the brand another chance or maybe there's even an active outreach program to get them back. They resubscribe, they repurchase. Seven, eight months go by, there's another issue, they unsubscribe, they stop purchasing. So you can't look at churn and say that it equals mathematically death. And this is important because I'm about to get into the product life cycle where real death means they never give you another dollar again. As a final comment on this future value component, because the value happens in the future, you cannot take it on a one for one dollar for dollar basis. People do not value the future the same way they value the present. It's one of the well-demonstrated facts of economics. 
that if it's $100 in the future, you value it at about $90 right now. That's why you have to get a return on investment. You have to forgo consumption in this period to get more consumption in a future period. This is very well demonstrated. This is how humans behave. And so because of that, you have to take what is called a present discount value approach. Any dollar that you have in the future, you have to discount it to what it would be worth in this moment. And this is really important for the future value component calculation of lifetime value because it is a common mistake for brands to say, they told us that they would buy X amount in the future that's worth this amount of dollars. And so it's a, let's say $100 in the future. And they just take that one for one. That's incorrect. You need to discount it to the present value in order to get a more accurate prediction of what's going to happen in the future. So let's talk about death. Another one of those things that economists have studied very well within brands is this pattern called the product life cycle. So just like humans, a product has a cycle where there is this point of initial introduction, so birth, the idea gets floated out there, there's some early adopters who like it, the idea starts to grow, it hits mass maturity, and then it slowly starts to die. Every product that has ever been studied in the history of of the world in economics follows this pattern. And you can look at it either through the revenue or through the profit lens. So again, lifetime value can use one of these two calculations to so to show you why that definition is important, look at this plot. In green is revenue. So in the very first stage of product development, this is sort of the conception stage, there's no revenue, but you are losing money because you are funding product development. So you are running at a negative profit rate. Once the product is ready, and you introduce it to the market, you can start to generate some revenue. And so you'll see that that green line starts at zero and starts to increase over time. And in that introduction phase, if you can get past those early adopters, people who are just super excited about the idea because it perfectly fits what they want, but you really need to bring it to mass market to get high revenue, high profit, that's when you transition into the growth stage. And this is where Startups love to focus their attention. They love to talk about the J-curve growth. And it happens between those two vertical lines between introduction and maturity, J-curve growth. You have rapidly increasing revenue. Every year, revenue increases more than the year before. But at some point, you hit an inflection point. So in, in calculus, this is called the second derivative. You are still increasing in revenue, meaning that revenue is positive year over year. And it's higher next year than it was the year before. However, it's higher at a lower rate. So you're increasing, but you're increasing at a decreasing rate. So yes, revenue goes up, but it went up just slightly less as a percentage than the year before. And then the year after, revenue still goes up, but it's even less than it was the year before or two years before. And that's a good sign that you are starting to hit the maturity phase of your market. And at some point, revenue will peak. And then revenue will start to decline year over year. And you'll have the same thing. You'll have, it's decreasing at an decreasing rate, and then it will start to decrease at an increasing rate. And that's when you know you're really on the way to death. If you look at the red line, the story of profit is very different. In that product development stage, you are running negative profits. You are spending money to bring the product to market. You have to develop it. You have to package it. You have to market it. Once the product is in market, you will see the turnaround in that profit rate starts to become starts to increase and eventually becomes positive. And it really becomes positive as you start that J curve growth. It will peak before the actual maturity phase. So it will peak at that inflection point where yes, your revenue is going up, but it's going up less than it was going up the year before. And as you die, if all you do is keep running business as normal, then your profit rates will hit zero or maybe even go negative again, where you start to finance your own death. And this whole process is called the product life cycle. Every single product that has ever existed has gone through this. And you will see there are different research or data science approaches for different stages of this life cycle. Lifetime value is really important in the growth and maturity stage. And ideally, you would already know the lifetime value and some of the persona optimization at the beginning of that growth phase. But my experience has been that you will not convince your organization when they're experiencing J-curve growth to spend money on understanding lifetime value because they're just making so much money and every year they're making more money. So who cares if we know the lifetime value? That, that really seems to be the way that most of these organizations operate. But as soon as revenue starts to slow, they immediately look for something, for an answer. And this is where lifetime value and personas become really important. But this is not something that most startups will do early on. 
you don't, often don't have the data that you need to do lifetime value calculations when you're in the introduction phase. But when you start to experience growth, that is a good time to start lifetime value optimization. Now, like the life cycle of a human being, everybody wants to know when they're gonna die. And so one of the most common questions that we get asked as soon as we point out this phenomenon to people is, well, when's my brand going to die? And it's pretty hard to say because there is no theory that says the product life cycle takes X amount of years. Coca-Cola as a brand has been around for more than 100 years. Compare that to the shake weight. You might remember this product from the late 2000s. This is an at-home exercise product that was popularized on as seen on TV marketing. This plot shows the search trend data from Google for the shake weight. You can see in it the actual product life cycle. There's almost no search around this product and suddenly it just climbs rapidly. It peaks very quickly and then it falls almost as fast as it peaked. And it has continued on at a level that was higher than it was before, but this is a product that is on its way to death. And the only way to avoid the product life cycle is not just to know your lifetime value, but to start to figure out how to pivot your product, how to, how to change your product into something else as you experience that declining revenue. And this is where brands like Apple and Google and Amazon have been incredibly forward looking. They don't just try to run the exact same product into the market over and over. They keep adapting it. They keep tweaking it. They bring in new products that are totally different, but somewhat related. And that allows them to keep bringing in revenue and positive profits. Now, when you go to calculate your lifetime value, Whatever data it is that you have, whether it's historical, monetary, historical, non-monetary, or you're using something to try to forecast in the future, all data can be defined by one of three origins. So this is how the data came into existence. It's either observational, survey, or experiment. And I'm gonna define each of these three in detail in a moment, but you should be using each because they are complementary. They are not substitutes. Survey data adds value to observational data. Experimental data adds value to both survey and observational data. And observational data adds value to survey and experiment data. Don't think about them as using one or the other. Think about them as using all of them together. So let's start with observational data. This is anything you can learn without directly talking to humans. So it's often captured by digital platforms. So within the marketing space, any marketing technology, Google Analytics, Facebook ads, all of those platforms have data capture built into them. This is machine to machine capture. It's really clean. It shows you as a strength exactly what did happen, but as a weakness, it might not show you what is going to happen in the future or why it happened. So often with observational data, it's cheap and it's easy to get, and it's very reliable. But once you get done mining it, you're often left with the, well, why? Why did this happen? And there's not anything in that data that can definitively answer that. You can create theories, you can do some testing, but ultimately, if you want to understand the why, you've got to talk to people. Because behind all of that machine to machine capture are humans. Your customers are humans. And so using survey as the origin adds a layer of predictability on top of that observational data. This is anything that you can learn by talking directly to people. So this is often done through qualitative interviews or quantitative surveys both of which I will outline that we did for DMC. A strength is that it shows you why something happened, but a weakness is that it's attitudinal. So they could be mistaken, they could be lying, they could be confused, they may change their mind afterwards. It doesn't necessarily show you what's what will happen, but it gives you a layer of predictive power that you're just not going to get on top of observational data by itself. And this is why I say use them both. If you're using observational data to understand a pattern and then you take it to the individuals who are behind it and you say, why this, why that? And they tell you that's far more predictive than your theory that you would come up on your own for that observational data. And the third and final is experimental data. And this is the holy grail of data. This is where if you want to understand causal relationships, you really need to be utilizing this method. It's because as an approach, it takes predetermined structured tests it uses talking to people, it uses observational data. You're applying the scientific method with this kind of data origin. So it gives you the strongest predictive power, but it has a huge cost. It's very complicated to set up. If you're not doing it correctly, it can mislead you very quickly because you will have a lot of confidence in a result that is spurious, that's not correct. So if you want to do experimental design. And probably the best example of this is conjoint analysis. So conjoint analysis is a survey-based approach to understanding people's willingness to pay. Rather than asking them, hey, do you wanna pay $5 or $4? Instead, you create bundles that have features and pricing and brands, 
And you present that to them and you just say, make a choice. Which of these five things would you actually buy? And then you present them a new five things after that. And after a while, if they've started to pick the ones they like and tell you the ones they don't like, you can start to behind the scenes infer through statistical processes what they actually value and buy how much without having ever asked the exact dollar amount. This was an approach that was developed by an economist to get at willingness to pay specifically because it's so difficult. It has become a very popular market research approach. Procter & Gamble has 30 analysts who do this all day. And they know the down to the penny level how much they have to charge to be profitable if a bar of soap moves from eye level to knee level in the grocery store, or if they change the packaging, or if they change the branding on it. And all of that's very important for them because they sell millions of bars of soap every single day all across the world. And so the ROI for this kind of approach is there. If you are a startup trying to figure out whether you should charge $15 or $19, this is not the right approach for you. You don't need that experimental precision yet. You need the qualitative survey feedback and you need observational data about your actual sales and you blend those together and you can get to profitable outcomes when it comes to lifetime value. And this gets to one of the most important simplifying assumptions about lifetime value calculations. No matter what you create, someone will come in and say, oh, it'd be better if we added this, this, and this. And that's true, it would be better. You may not have that data right now. You may not ever be able to get that data in the future. In the end, whatever calculation you make has to be based at this present moment on what you have available. Doesn't mean that you should be turning a blind eye to what you can get in the future, but you have to use what's actually available. You will be cherry picking data. You will be using variables as proxies for other things you'd really like to measure, but you can't yet. And that's fine. You just need to be clear about what those assumptions are. And over time, you should try to validate them as much as possible. And you should try to fill gaps where you can. But right now, if you went to your data sets as digital marketers and you started to look at what's available, that's it. That's what you can use. And it's better to use that than to sit and wait for some perfect future where you hope you'll get better information. And that's because even with these rudimentary metrics that you have right now, lifetime value has a higher return on investment than any other metric. And so something that is better is the ideal, not something that's perfect. Let's look at a couple of the examples of success stories where lifetime value has been used. And then I'll jump into some of the common pitfalls where people and things go wrong. I said this about startups and their J-curve growth. This is just true overall. People don't like to change. It's hard to motivate them to change, even when change is necessary. But here, here's why you should be thinking about lifetime value, regardless of where you're at in your product lifecycle. You can be doing well at the expense of doing amazing and never even know it. You don't see the sales you lost because you didn't follow through with the highest value customers, potentially highest value customers. So because you don't see them, it's easy to ignore that they exist, but they do exist. We'll get into the Pareto principle, but there are individual customers, one in five customers who are bringing in 80% of the revenue. Every time you mess up one of those sales, it has a far bigger impact on the overall revenue and profitability of the organization than any other. So when you're just blindly looking at clicks or impressions or conversions, and you're not looking for the underlying differentiation between the Pareto persona that I'll talk about tonight and the average customer, then every loss is not equal. Some hurt you far more than others and you just don't see them. So it's easy to ignore them. And if you've been relying on luck to this point, it is only a matter of time till a competitor does this kind of work, figures out lifetime value, and they will so easily outcompete you in every arena. They will market more efficiently than you. They will hire better salespeople because they're offering higher converting sales leads. They will design better products that are more responsive to the customer experience. They will provide better customer experience and reduce churn and be, all of that will result in higher profitability for them. And that gives them the war chest to fight effectively against you. Now within the lifetime value, and this is true of any metric, but within the lifetime value, there is a Pareto persona. So this is known in the marketing world as the 80-20 rule, right? 80% of the 80 of the outcomes from marketing are happening from 20% of the efforts. This is true in almost every data distribution that I've ever studied. So this idea comes from an economist whose name was Pareto who studied pea pods in his garden. So he would look at pea pods and then he would open them up and he'd measure how many peas came out of each pod. And he started to realize that 20% of the pods were producing 80% of the total peas. And he thought, okay, that's kind of interesting. Wrote up his theory, put it out there. Since then, other people 
have studied this and they have confirmed that this shows up in nature all over the place. So it shows up in beehives. It shows up in ant colonies. If you go to the link that's in the bottom left on this slide, it's called the lazy ant study. One in five are doing 80% of the work. And if you take those different groups, if you take the one in five ant that's doing 80% of the work and the four in five ants who aren't doing most of the work, they're only contributing 20%. They're doing some, but not, not by any means most. So this is again, one of those well demonstrated patterns in nature. And you have this happening in your customer base as a brand. One in five of your customers is bringing in 80% of the value. So when you start to look at lifetime value, it's not normally distributed. You can't just assume that any one average customer is similar to any one other average customer. There's going to be one very distinct and different group and you should pay close attention to who they are. And this has been a successful use case for a lot of brands. Let's start with a marketing use case. So overstock.com has guided customer acquisition decision-making based on lifetime value, not just on conversion in the next stage. And in the course of a few months, they've been able to more than double their return on ad spend by using lifetime value as the guide for placing ads and targeting customers rather than conversions and impressions and, and some of the other metrics that just don't have the same kind of impact as lifetime value. What about sales? So next stage in the life cycle, Sales leads should be scored based on their lifetime value because this would include a probability of conversion and at a higher value. And those two things together are what should guide sales lead scoring. IBM is a great use case for this because without changing anything related to their marketing spend, by using lifetime value, they saw a 10 times increase in revenue through their sales efforts. And that's because sales teams were guided not just by conversion rate probability, but by conversion rate probability on value. And by focusing their attention there, they did realize more revenue. But lifetime value isn't just useful at those early stages of the funnel. It's very useful for product development. So here's another great example from the Silicon Slopes chat books. Their product development team, because the cost of product development is so high, decided to start using lifetime value as one of the guiding metrics. When they get feature requests, when they get bug fix requests, you know, they're inundated with hundreds of these things a day. How do you prioritize them and then hand them off to developers, which are a very high cost of business right now? So within the organization, there's something called efficiency ratios. That efficiency ratio shows you that for every dollar of revenue, some percentage is spent on an activity. In the past, sales and marketing has hovered around 20 to 30%, and it's been one of the largest of the efficiency ratios. The only one that has now started to challenge that in its total percentage is product development. It is not uncommon for 30 to 40% of every dollar of revenue spent to go back into some kind of product development. And so prioritizing these requests is really important. You don't want to just prioritize them randomly. You don't want to just count up, hey, everybody wanted this one, so we're going to do it. In the end, that spend, that cost on the product development needs to help the organization realize more revenue. And Chatbooks was very successful in doing this. They streamlined their development efforts around things that allow them to increase revenue and profit using lifetime value. Potentially the most powerful use case for lifetime value in the organization, and I said at the beginning, this is why lifetime value was so powerful, is it had a use case at every one of these stages in the customer journey across all these different departments within the organization. Potentially one of the most impactful is customer experience. It can be 25 times more expensive to replace an existing customer than it is to acquire a new one. And look at what we've just gone through. If you have to redo all of that marketing, all of that sales and all of that product development around a customer and then you lose them, you get to go do all that again for a new customer. So it's not surprising that this, because this happens at the late stages of the funnel, it has such a high cost impact. And Netflix did a really good job of figuring this out. So personalizing the customer experience around lifetime value. And they did it in an interesting way, because when you talk about the Pareto principle, do you just focus on that 20% who's bringing in the 80% of revenue? Or do you divide them and then deal with the subdivision that happens? There's no clear answer right now to that question. Now, Netflix figured out from their cost accounting that there were individual customers who were costing them so much that their lifetime value was negative. And rather than just focus on providing better service to everybody, one of the pieces of their strategy, and I emphasize this is only one, was to cut off those individuals who had a negative lifetime value. And this is highly controversial because some organizations don't want the bad press that comes along with this. But Netflix, based on the data, 
made a hard calculation. There are individual customers who are a net drain on us as an organization, and we will no longer service them. Now, at the same time they did that, they were also improving the experience of their high value customers, the people who binge watch, and they have all the data necessary to figure out who these different types of customers are. The point is, that they didn't just try to target one, they went through the entire customer experience for all of them and said, there are high value people, we're gonna treat them this way. There are low value people, we're gonna treat them this way. And if you want to go down that path of personalization, lifetime value is the best guide. Because in the end, you can put yourself into bankruptcy, both by buying clicks and pursuing sales and developing product and optimizing customer experience around those negative value customers. So those are the successful use cases. What can go wrong? What are the typical things that stand in the way to an organization when using lifetime value? And there are really four. One is that they fail to overcome a cold start, and I'll define each of these in a moment. Another is that they never get to an individual level value. Netflix could figure that out because they had individual level values. A third is that you get stuck on revenue, you never make the transition to profit. And this is where cost accounting comes in. This is why you can put yourself in a bankruptcy real fast chasing revenue if the net result is less profit. Or you make simplifying assumptions that are incorrect overall or they just over time break down. So let's go into each of these one by one. So in data science, the cold start problem is that you either don't have the necessary data or you don't have enough of it to do the kind of work you'd like. And this is very common for organizations. Even if they have data, Often it's never been leveraged, and if you start to dig into it, it might not be useful, it wasn't collected the right way, it has holes, and so you have to recollect data you might already be sitting on. And for whatever reason, this is just one of those barriers that some organizations can't seem to break through. They hit this first obstacle and they go, yeah, data science doesn't work, we're going back to guiding off of our gut. And this is why 80% of data projects are failing right now, is this problem, just getting moving. The second is that there's no individual value. They stay focused on those aggregate averages and those averages lie. So net promoter score is a good example. I have, I've often given this example in other presentations. It's a zero to 10 scale. So let's assume you get feedback from two customers. One tells you they had an experience of zero. So they're a detractor. Another tells you that they had an experience of 10. So they're a promoter. And then you average them right? Zero plus 10 divided by two is five. And you say, ah, we've got a five average. It's not bad. We can do a little bit to move it up to a six or seven or eight. Well, actually nobody had that experience. You had two totally different experiences. And in one case, you want to learn from it and improve on it. And in the other case, you got to do damage control. And so if you think you're in the average, then you're going to sit there passively and both of those experiences go to waste. And so averages are very misleading, especially in the presence of the Pareto principle. So you can't stop there on those average values. You have to get down to personas, that's the next level, and then eventually pass personas all the way down into individual level values. And this is hard because of cost accounting. And this is where getting stuck on revenue creates another problem. If you're only looking at revenue, then you will not see the relationship to the costs. And there are different kinds of costs. There are sunk costs, you're never getting them back. There's fixed costs, variable costs. In accounting, there's something called the death spiral. So you eliminate a product because when you look at it as far as the cost accounting, it looks really bad. So you cut that product, but you lose all the revenue that product was bringing in and you change nothing when it comes to your fixed costs. And now your other products don't look so great on paper either. So you just start cutting products till you literally have nothing left as a company. And that gets to the inability to assign costs to products or individuals. And this is starting to change in cost accounting. There's a big movement to make sure that you can get at least to the product costing effectively, and then eventually to the individual costing. But if you don't do that, then guiding by revenue is flying blind because you could produce $5 of revenue that costs you $10 to service, and you are $5 upside down in profit. And that just can't go on for a long time. And then the final problem is that you just make some bad assumptions. So you will have to make assumptions, and it's more of an art than a science. But if you make assumptions in one time period. Things like the introduction of a new product, either from you or a competitor, or changes in market preferences or technologies, any of those things can mean that the foundation on which that assumption was built change. And when that changes, your assumption is no longer valid. And the only way to resolve this problem is to constantly be testing and validating. It's to use the scientific method. This is not a one and done process with a t-test. That is not the scientific method. The scientific method is continual testing with clear hypotheses 
to validate that what you believe has a high probability of being true. And any one test coming back and invalidating some of what you know should not be the basis for completely changing your strategy. If you have run a test 20 times and it has validated your assumptions, and you then run test 21 and it invalidates your assumptions, you should not throw out all of your assumptions quite yet. You should run that test a couple more times. Now, if you run it a second time and a third time and a fourth time, and each of those new tests shows that your assumption has been invalidated, it is time to seriously consider changing your assumptions. Because there is something that happens called change point, and we'll talk about change point analysis. Just because you validated it 20 times does not mean that it's gonna stay that way forever, but one test should not erode 20. And this is why the scientific method is difficult, and so approach this as a Bayesian. Within statistics, there are two schools of thought. One is the frequentist, and this is what you were taught in any intro stats class you ever had. You assume a probability distribution, you run a t-test, you do a hypothesis, and you either reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. The Bayesian approach is you do that, but you update what you already know based on that new outcome. So this is what I was saying about if you've run it 20 times and you do one more test and it invalidates it, you've got to weigh that one against the 20 that you previously experienced. And so while this may be a little bit slower to getting to new outcomes, it is far more stable. And machine learning algorithms that are built on Bayesian foundations have far outperformed any of the old traditional frequentist statistics. So let's recap what we've done so far. We've covered the three definitions of lifetime value, monetary, non-monetary, and future. We've talked about all the things involved with that calculation. We've talked about specific use cases where this has been successful. We've talked about things that typically stand in the way, barriers, obstacles. All of that has been very high level theoretical. Let's ground this now in an actual worked example. So what follows here is from last month's DMC event. So for those who are not familiar, because this may be the first event you've ever attended with DMC, the Digital Marketing Collective runs monthly events. Every single month, third Wednesday of the month, in the evening, they host one of these events like tonight, where presenters come in and they talk about some topic each for an hour. They were gracious enough to give me two hours because I knew that I was going to go long because I wanted to present this worked example. And this worked example is about their annual event. So in the month of August, unlike their other monthly events, they run a very large conference. There are hundreds of attendees. So this year was 520 attendees. They come from all over the state, out of the state. They had national presenters. This is a very large conference and it is fundamentally different than their monthly events. And so that's important because what I'm going to cover now is only about that annual conference. It does not include data about their monthly events, which are built really on membership. But before we dive in, and to build on what we did last month at the DMC annual event, let's play another game, economists love games. Get on Twitter and answer this question. What is the lifetime value of DMC's Pareto persona to within $10? Now this is only for their annual event. This has nothing to do with membership or attendance at the monthly events. This is only for the conference. So of the 520 people that attended, let's look at the Pareto persona. So the one in five who are bringing in 80% of the value, what is their lifetime value? And I'm gonna answer this question shortly, but get on Twitter and answer this quickly. You got a couple minutes. I'm gonna keep going at this point, but that's our Twitter handle, Adam Peritas SG. And you'll be notified on Twitter if you were within that $10 spread. To tell you the story of what was done to calculate lifetime value for that annual event, I'm going to use the three-part process that is employed at Imperitas. This is something that I developed teaching at the University of Utah and then brought and refined at Imperitas. It involves these three steps. The first is thinking broadly, making sure that we fully understand the context of the problem that we are being asked to solve by using data. The second step is mining deeply. This is all the analytical mechanical processes. What kind of analysis are we doing and why? What kind of results are we producing and why? And then the third, and this is arguably the most important of the three, because if you don't do it successfully, the previous two don't matter, is how do you then explain this large problem and this complex analysis in very simple terms that non-data scientists, non-researchers can understand? And if you want to go to the bottom left, you can read about this process on our website. You can link from that to our case studies and see where we have employed this. Before I jump in, there are three cautions I want to give you. And I mentioned this earlier that perfection is the enemy. So this quote in Latin means progress, not perfection. Do not focus on creating a perfect solution the first time through. 
you will fail just like the 80% of data projects who hit that cold start and just stop. They failed. They don't want to try anymore. They're taking their ball and they're going home. That desire for perfection right off the bat is what kills most of these projects. You should be aiming for something that is better tomorrow than it was today. And if you keep doing that, you will make incremental progress till you actually reach the end goal that you wanted, which is a very strong, robust system. My second caution is this takes a team. If you think you're going to hire one data scientist to do all of this, you will fail because it requires a team. There were about nine people who were involved in Imperitas on the production of this entire study. A couple of people from marketing who were making really easy to understand persona sheets and customer journey maps, data scientists who were doing all the melting and casting and ETL work, analysts who were doing all the data mining, researchers who were conducting the in-depth interviews and fielding the survey, a project leader who managed this entire team, it required multiple people with differing skill sets to do this effectively. And so you can't just assume that you have one person in your organization who's going to tackle all of this on their own. It's just too many skill sets. There's no such thing as this data science unicorn. And then the third is organization is key. That means creating audio recordings of your actual meetings internally as you strategize. So when you go through your SMART goals, recording that meeting. When you're conducting in-depth interviews, recording those calls. When you're having strategy meetings and updates with your internal team, recording those. The reason for that is it will create transparency and accountability. And if everybody has access to them, then no component can be used in sort of a predatory, discriminatory manner. You have to be accountable for this kind of project to work. And the best way to do that is by having a recorded record of everything every stage of the way. The process of thinking broadly itself can be broken down into five steps. The first is creating SMART goals and doing a data audit. The second is road mapping the entire project visually. The third is then doing secondary research and competitive intelligence. This is followed by conducting qualitative interviews and finally by fielding a quantitative survey. And I outlined this process for you because there is a temptation to immediately jump to step five. Every time that someone wants to think broadly about a project or a problem, they say, let's go do a survey. And that's a mistake. You're missing some really key components that help you build to an effective survey. And I think this is why survey research has gotten such a bad reputation. It's because people skip four necessary steps, jump right to a survey, produce something, and they say, that was not useful. Let's not ever do that again. So let's go through each of these five in detail. This is the most important single step in the process. I said explaining simply is the most important as far as the overall, but you can't explain anything simply at the end of this if you don't know where you were supposed to be going. And this is why getting everybody on the same page through the process of SMART goals at the beginning of the project is so important. And we did this with DMC. And if you go to the bottom left, you can go to the link and you can see the seven SMART goals that were outlined for this project. Some are very specifically tied to lifetime value. Some of them were not lifetime value focused and we will answer those in the the deliverables. But we all knew on our side as an organization, on their side as an organization, here's the target, Here's what we're going to do. And the SMART acronym stands for Specific, Measurable, Actionable, Relevant, Timely. That is a way to divide up the goal into components that help keep everybody on the same page when it comes to who's doing what, when they're doing it, the dependencies that are involved, the deliverables that will be shared as a result. And so if you can do this, if you can define these goals and measures of success and due dates, you can then assign it to individuals, directly responsible individuals, and identify the key performance indicators that you're going to use. So with the case of DMC, we had three data sets from the data audit that we did as part of the SMART goals that we knew we were going to use. The first was Eventbrite, so this is the ticketing purchase system. The second was HubSpot, this is the marketing email website component to the event. And the third was Qualtrics. So the first two of those are observational in origin. The third is survey. We're blending them. There was no need to use experimental design, basically like using a sledgehammer to swat a mosquito in this case. So we were only using two of the three origins, but notice that we are using both observational and survey data. With those SMART goals in place, since we knew what needed to happen, who was gonna handle what, what was a measure of success, the due dates for everything, we were able to visualize the entire project. So this is a project management software we use Each of those components you could click on in the software, dig in, and you could see related documents and who was assigned to it. There were chat communication abilities within it. This created the kind of transparency and visibility into the project that allows it to keep moving forward constantly. And we work on an agile schedule, 
So every two weeks, we are updating this to make sure that we are on task. Now this visual is called a Gantt chart and different project management tools can or cannot produce this. So some people love using Trello, some people love using Spera, some people love using Asana. That's fine, each of them has their pros and cons, but you really need to look for one that allows you to create this kind of visual because it expresses to people so quickly the overall process and the dependencies and the responsibilities and the way that it cascades together that you just don't see in a list of tasks with people's names on them. Now, once the SMART goals were done and the data audit had been completed, the next step that we always follow is conducting secondary research. There is a wealth of existing information out there that on any problem that you're facing right now, whether it's lifetime value or not. So in the case of this, it was, what is the lifetime value of digital marketing conference attendees? It was shocking how much information we were able to find about that. And if you go to the bottom left here, you will see the actual source sheet where all of these secondary research sources are being compiled by specific analysts. In this sheet, you will see a column that says, this is how we're gonna use it in the research. The point is that we don't take the next step until we feel like we've exhausted the existing wealth of information that's out there. Why go recreate it blindly on our own when we can learn what other people did? Sometimes you can find whole other studies that were done, surveys and qualitative interview scripts and things like, for example, this slide deck is gonna end up on SlideShare DMC said they're going to share it with everybody after this presentation. It's going to be out there so that if someone else conducted a secondary research project on digital marketing conferences, they're going to see this entire process laid out crystal clear. With that secondary information, we now start to have our first sense of the big picture. You know, we have the SMART goals now. We have this big picture. How do we refine it down? There's too much information out there. We've got to cut through the noise. And this is where qualitative interviews are perfect. And we usually opt for in-depth interviews over a focus group because often you're not trying to measure a group dynamic and you don't have a physical product where you need to see somebody actually open it. And in-depth interviews are just a more efficient way to get at that, that info. Now, these qualitative interviews are really conversations. If you go to this link, you can't break it, play it around with it. This is the forward-facing script that we use. Now, when we're actually conducting these interviews, we're on the back end. We're scrolling up and down through the whole thing, making sure everything gets read because we want it to follow more of a natural conversation. So we're not typing while we do these. We're maximizing the time we have with that individual to prod and probe and go deeper into questions as we have them. But it is still structured. And we are after two different kinds of individuals. We, in this case for DMC, we were after people who had been to past DMC events, annual events, so these would be customers, and then we were after people who'd been to past DMC events and a whole bunch of other digital marketing conferences or conferences overall. And that's because they, are, they have an expertise that the average customer does not have. We can ask them about their experience at other conferences. So if they've been to 10 other conferences, we talked to one person who'd been to 15 in a year. That person's not the same as a DMC customer who comes once or twice and doesn't go to any other conferences in a year. And that, other, that expertise is really great for refining down the secondary research that matters. So, hey, we've found you know 200 sources. They kind of cover this, this, and this. What do you think is important? They say, oh, this part is so important. This other stuff doesn't matter that much. But they're also great at helping us figure out where there's a hole in what we found through the secondary research. So a good example for DMC is that we found no secondary information whatsoever about the importance of an event app, a dedicated app to the event. But we talked to two experts and both of them mentioned how much it improved the experience of the event to have these dedicated apps. And so you conduct, you know, five of these. The rule of thumb is usually you conduct three to five of these expert interviews. You conduct somewhere between 10 to 30 of these customer interviews. But from that, you will be able to say, look, we have these SMART goals we're working on. We found all of the secondary research. We're narrowing it down to this portion that matters because we had these conversations with people and they told us X, Y, and Z. And from that, you are then finally in a place to move to that fifth step that everybody jumps ahead to, which is writing a quantitative survey. This should build on everything you've done to this point. And every question, it's like real estate, every question on that survey is valuable property. So you better know exactly why you're asking it. You better be asking it in the exact way that you know is gonna produce the kind of information you'll use for analytical processes. And you only have so much time with individuals. So some of the other lectures, if you go to the Imperitas YouTube channel and you look at the Dawn of the Data Age lecture series, 
We've done a lot around survey research. You can go watch those, but you'll see in some of those videos, there's a rule of thumb that you can only ask so many questions in a minute to a person. So the different kinds of questions you ask will sum up to a total length of time for the survey. And depending on your incentive and depending on the connection that the individuals have to the organization, you can only ask so many questions in total. Now with DMC, most of the people filling out the survey are highly engaged with the organization. That helps us, that lets us collect more information through the survey at one time. It's also a pretty good incentive that was being offered. And so we saw it was an 18 minute survey on average. We had about 60% of people, a 60% response rate, 42% completed it. Most of the drop off that we saw was at the very end when we asked for information related to their incentive claim. So do you want the incentive? Yes, no. If they said yes, then give us your name and email and then they just bailed out. Overall, we got a lot of information and because we used Qualtrics as the tool, and you can go to this link and play with the preview of Qualtrics. The preview link allows you to see what it looks like on mobile and on a desktop. You can set bookmarks. So you can go back and forth and test skip logic and display logic. You can really reverse engineer the entire survey with that link. Qualtrics is an incredibly powerful tool and it allows for uploading all the observational data ahead of time. So everything we had from Eventbrite and HubSpot, we were able to upload into the Qualtrics survey. That information could be used to determine certain kinds of questions. It could also just be appended to the data set one for one at the end so that we don't have any data transformation issues, which I'll get to in a moment. So Qualtrics is an incredibly powerful tool and we have used it for all the years that we've done this survey work with DMC. Okay, that's the thinking broadly step. It shouldn't take more than a few weeks to get through that entire process. You've defined the problem, you've done your secondary research, you've had qualitative interviews, you design a quantitative survey, you field it, you get the information back. In that same period of time, there are other data sets that are out there, both internal data sets like HubSpot and Eventbrite for DMC. There's other data that's not proprietary to DMC that's available that you can use. And this brings us to the next stage in this process of mining deeply. Just like with the thinking broadly process, there are five steps. Again, everybody wants to just jump right ahead to five. Just start building predictive models. Just go right to regression analysis, and that's incorrect. There are a series of steps you need to move through in order to produce predictive models. The first is manually inspecting the data. The second is performing ETL. This is extracting, transforming, and loading the data. This is all the transformation stuff I mentioned. The third is then conducting exploratory data analysis. And a good portion of your time is spent here, making sure you really understand what's happening for any one variable individually. Once that's done, you can move to the descriptive kind of analysis like clustering, or I'll talk about change point analysis that we did. But now you're starting to look at relationships across variables. And at that point, finally, you're ready to build a predictive model like we have for LTV, like the one that I showed at the very beginning of these slides. So let's go through each of these individually. Do not skip the manual inspection process. It's here twice. Seriously, do not skip this. You need to open whatever data sets you're gonna look at. You need to have a data map. If you don't have one, you're gonna to need to create one so that every variable, meaning the columns, and every row, whatever it is that you have, whether it's individuals or it's campaigns, that you understand the difference between rows and columns, how they're scaled, how they're measured, and if you go to this link in the bottom left, you will see an output, a PDF output of the Qualtrics survey with all the variable codings. It provides the data map for that survey data. You can look up any question, see exactly how it was asked. That gets, that's very important to the interpretation of the results, by the way, but also see the way in which each of the choice options was coded. And that's gonna be important when we get to the LTV equation, because if you don't understand that coding, you can't program that equation correctly. The next is ETL. So again, this stands for extract, transform, and load. This basically comes down to data cleaning. And most data scientists will tell you that at least half of their time is spent prepping data before it's useful. Two of the most common processes that you will do in that kind of transformation are melting and casting. So this is taking columns and turning them into rows or taking rows and turning them into columns. So for example, with DMC, HubSpot outputs data given in rows when it really needs to be in columns if you want to use it for other things. And so you have to be able to transform that data. So you will take that, that's casting. You'll take multiple rows and turn them into columns. This is called going long to going wide. Or the alternative is you might have a multiple select question from a Qualtrics survey where every single column is one of the choice options from that same question. And you might want to combine them into one column 
that has many rows, and so that's melting the data. You really need to understand these two processes because you're going to do them over and over. And so there's a link down here in the bottom left to melting and casting data in R. There's also a link to the Imperitas survey data cleaning checklist. When you're dealing with survey data, you have an additional level of validation you need to apply. There's 12 steps in that checklist. And really what it comes down to is quarantining responses that might not be valid. Maybe people were taking the survey because they wanted the incentive. Maybe people were just giving you bogus information. Maybe people figured out a way to retake the survey a few times. You've got to go through a process to make sure that the data that you end up using is clean and ready for analysis. And survey data requires that additional step. It is about confirming that responses are valid and should be included in the analysis. But with the cleaning done, now you're ready to start to explore the data. And really, most of this just comes down to three things. You're looking for measures of shape, center, and spread. And depending on the type of measurement of the variable, that's another thing that if you go back earlier in the slides, there was a link to interpreting data like a pro, which is a lecture from Imperitas. Go there, you'll hear about data origin, which we've already covered, but you'll also hear about data measurement. And data measurement is very important. What kind of variable is it? Is it nominal? Is it ordinal? Is it interval or is it ratio? The answer to that question determines the kind of analysis you can do, both exploratory, but more importantly, descriptive and predictive. What you're basically after are either tables or visuals, and this is complementary in nature as well. It's not one or the other. You need to produce tables. Often it's the five number summary, so the min, the max, the quartiles. Sometimes it'll include the mean in addition to the median, but you're getting a sense of the distribution of a variable. Sometimes it's just proportions if it's nominal, just counts if it's nominal. And then you need to create plots. Tables are great because they express a lot of information concisely, but no one can visualize mentally the same pattern in a table that they can in an actual plot. And these plots can be donut charts, bar charts, box plots, histograms, density plots, you need some sort of tabular version, you need some sort of visual. Now for lifetime value, this included 20 variables. So we as a team were exploring these 20 individual variables and we did it more than once. EDA is not a one and done process. You meet as a team, figure out who's gonna do which portion, we call it an analytics treasure map. Everybody's given a portion in that treasure map that they go and they mine. After they have discovered stuff, we all come back and we have a meeting where we talk about what was found, what were the patterns. It is inevitable that you will want to do another pass. And if you repeat this process over and over and over, eventually you'll see that you're not learning anything new and that's when it's time to move on to the next stage. But we did five rounds of exploratory analysis on this DMC data, just on those 20 variables. And it's often because we started with 15 variables, for example, but as we mined one, we realized it either was what we wanted or wasn't what we wanted. We might need something else. And so the list of variables both expanded and contracted. Some were cut, some were added. But five passes were done for exploratory analysis on this data to calculate LTV. Once you feel like you understand the shape, center, and spread of all the variables that you're going to use in your model, now you need to do some additional deep digging. And this is where descriptive analysis comes in. So the first approach that we used was called clustering. And I'll explain how clustering was different from change point analysis, both of which are descriptive approaches. So within clustering, what we were trying to do was find personas. Could we find a group that was as similar as possible given all 20 of those variables while being as simultaneously dissimilar as everybody else? So this is the idea of clustering, and this is the visualization of that clustering process. We used a hierarchical clustering approach. You can use various others. You can go to the link here in the bottom left and get the actual R script that we use, see the variables that were involved. But the idea was how do we take these variables and find groups that are as similar as possible within it while being as dissimilar simultaneously as everybody else? How are they unique? And there's nothing that tells you that a clustering algorithm has produced an accurate outcome. This is where you need the thinking broadly step. So we ran this approach. You can run different numbers of clusters, different clustering approaches. We ran a few of them and we settled in on this because the result that popped out made sense. There were really three groups. One were in-house B2B or B2C teams. The second were large digital marketing organizations and the third were small digital marketing organizations. Those three clusters as personas made a lot of sense. If you're an internal team, you're approaching this a little bit differently than an agency. If you're an external agency, you're either really large or you're very small. Those are real groups that we know we've seen, we understood. 
Now, the clustering algorithm produced these individual personas. What we then found as we mined them for actionable differences is that they really didn't differ at all. In fact, we ended up scrapping the idea of three different personas and only went after the Pareto persona because from an actionability standpoint, meaning how they become aware, the kinds of things that they come to the event for, the ways in which they could be grown as organizations, none of that really differed between them, even though the clustering algorithm said there really are these three distinct groups. Now, the second descriptive approach that we applied was called change point analysis. So what you're looking at here is a plot of the ticket sale revenue over time. So this is from early March all the way till the event in late August. And you can immediately see there are two distinct groups. This is called bimodality. Anytime you find bimodality, you know that you're dealing with two different distinct groups. The group on the left has been color coded to black because we believed that they were fundamentally different than the group on the right that's in the pinkish red. And what differed is there's months between them where nothing happens with ticket sales. Why, what is going on? So we plotted out all of the emails, tweets, Facebook messages that we could find from HubSpot to the ticket sale data in Eventbrite and said, what is going on here? And our hypothesis, which we have since confirmed with leaders of DMC, is that the group that is coded black here on the far left were the diehard monthly attendees who were hearing about early bird pricing. And the black also corresponds to when early bird pricing ends. So you can see there are a couple little spikes of ticket purchases after that. But everything in black happened before a change point when early bird pricing ended. Well, that early bird pricing is highly correlated with monthly attendees. So this is highly correlated with membership status. And we asked the leadership, how were people learning about this? If they're not learning about it from emails and social media posts, how are they learning about it? And the answer was that at the monthly events, people were being told tickets are available now, go buy them at the early bird price. So there was a premium for being a membership that you could capture by being at a monthly event, hearing about this, and then going and buying a ticket. And you can see that clear as day in the data. Now, over time, that changed. And most of what drove the later part of the signup were just traditional emails and social media ads and still some monthly event mentions. Now, if you look at where most of the revenue came from, it is closer to the event, which is what you see on the right-hand side of this plot. These are important change points. This is why we do descriptive analysis. There was something systematically that differed between these. So if we had just run an RFM model and treated all of these as equal, we would have missed this very important theoretical component. What was driving ticket sales at different times? Now, with that EDA done, with that descriptive analysis done, we're ready to produce a predictive model. This is the lifetime value model. So let me turn on my laser pointer here, and we'll go through each piece of these. So lifetime value is equal to the sum of the monetary, non-monetary, and future value. The monetary component is just gross revenue total. So this is the sum of the product of ticket sales at any ticket price. So if you were an early bird ticket price times the amount you purchased in one year over time for the last four years, this is all that would be used in an RFM model. So this is why I say that the RFM model is incomplete. It misses all of these additional components. The next component that we include is the non-monetary. It's actually this and this. So we're using two questions from the survey. Overall satisfaction, and net promoter score. So the way to read this is, look, if you had this gross revenue total, meaning you had the actual ticket purchases from Eventbrite over time, and then you added to it, based on the satisfaction level, these components. So if you're a four or five, this is where variable coding is important. Overall satisfaction was measured on a one through five scale. One and two were unsatisfied, different levels of unsatisfaction. Three was a neutral. Four and five were, were those who had positive levels of satisfaction. Then one of these three components gets added. If you're a four or five, then we add this. One times alpha squared times gross revenue total. Alpha is the correlation coefficient between overall satisfaction and gross revenue total. So by squaring it, we get the explained variance. So the idea here is there is an explained component of the revenue that has happened in the past that has been tied to non-monetary values. So we're gonna denominate it still in dollars, but notice the one means that you're gonna add this component. 
If you're a three, you get nothing. That's why the zero just basically washes that out. If you're a one or two, then there's a penalty. You get the negative one times this. And that's a way of bringing satisfaction as a non-monetary proxy into the model. We do the exact same thing now with net promoter score. Nine and 10, so you're a promoter, you get one times beta. Again, beta is going to be the correlation coefficient between net promoter score and gross revenue total. Beta squared is the explained variance. So one times the explained variance of gross revenue total gets added to gross revenue total as a non-monetary component. If you're a seven or eight, a passive or a neutral, you get nothing. If you're a zero through six, you're a detractor, you get a penalty of negative one. These two things are the non-monetary component. Then we add to it, and this is where it gets a little bit more complicated. We then add to it the future value. And for that, we're gonna use four different variables. Likelihood to return, that's a survey question. Previous DMCs they've attended, that's a survey question. Number of tickets that they purchased, that's an observational data piece from Eventbrite, and willingness to pay, which is the also from the survey. So let's go through this in two parts. If you said you were likely to return, that was coded as a one. If you said no, it was a zero. If you said you weren't sure, that was coded as a two. So that survey question had three options. Yes, no, not sure. So here's the no, here's the yes, and here's the not sure. So based on how that was answered, you either add this component or this component. So what you'll notice is that if you said no or you're not sure, you get nothing. It's zero times the number of tickets you've purchased up to that point times your willingness to pay. We have values for each of these things, but you get multiplied by zero and it goes away. What we're interested in is if they're likely to return next year, because they said yes, then you know what were the previous years that they attended? And what you see here is there are actually four components. It's not one or the other. You could be any of these. So if you're a 98, that was the coding for 2018 is the first year you ever attended. That means that you get this component added. If you attended in 2018 and 2017, both of these would get added. If you attended in 2018, 17, and 16, all of those are added and so on till 2015. There was no event in 2014. So we have the past four years of attendance here that will then determine which of these pieces gets added to it. Now, number of tickets was in that specific year, so this is 2018. Number of tickets here is 2017, 16, and 15. Willingness to pay comes from the survey question. And it asks specifically, okay, you paid this amount. How much more were you willing to pay above and beyond that? Now, these are our discount factors. I said that you can't just take the present value. You can't just take future value one for one. You have to discount it to the present level. So these are actually built on a one-year lag. So delta is the percentage of people who were there in 18 that were there in 17. Epsilon is the percentage of people that were there in 17 that were there in 16 and all the way back in time. So these are on a one year lag. Now, ADA, if you go to this sheet right here, same one that I showed you at the beginning of the slides, what you will see is that ADA is set to zero because there was no percentage that were there in 2014. The event didn't exist. This is 0 0.10, 0 0.18, 0.23. And so if you're likely to return next year and you only came in 2018, then 0.23 times the number of tickets you purchased in 18 times your willingness to pay is the future value component. We are only forecasting out one year. And that is because it is a simplifying assumption. We only have four years of data to go on. It's pretty hard to build predictive models with any sort of accuracy into the future when you've got a few years. We're at the cold start problem. That doesn't mean that we don't try, and it doesn't mean that next year we can't add precision, but we have to work with what we have, and we think that this is a good starting metric. From that, we can add all these components. So if you're a diehard who's been every single year, all of these get added to your non-monetary component and to your monetary component. And from that, we get a total lifetime value. Everything that we did has been documented in R. So we use R, it's open source, it's free, it's wonderful, it's powerful, it has a great community behind it. Everything about that, that LTV model is in here. Some of the exploratory data analysis is in here. Some of the data cleaning is in here. And the reason we do that, and you can link to it right there in the bottom left, is that you can then go reproduce it. You don't have the original data set, but if you did, you could upload that data into your working directory and immediately reproduce everything that we have done. 
This begins the process of automating analytical processes. So you could use Excel. I encourage you not to go down that path. I think it's a crutch. I think you should look at something like R or Python where you can start to really recreate processes. We're gonna do this work in 2019 again. So why not get everything set up in 2018 to use even 80% of it again in 2019? Now that ends the mining deeply stage. The next is taking all of this work that we have done and explaining it simply. Again, five sub components to this process. Nobody seems to jump ahead, by the way, to five on this one. Almost nobody even gets to five. But if you're gonna explain things simply, there's five steps to that process. The first are creating dashboards where needed. These are fast. It is easy to set up dashboards. And a lot of organizations get bogged down right here. They create dashboards and they think they're done. They plug in Tableau and they're done. But you need to move beyond that. There are additional deliverables that you can create. Specifically, in our case, we made a customer journey map and we made a Pareto persona sheet. Those two things summarize a lot of data in an easy to relate to form. From there, we built an LTV 360 report. We recorded that report. I'll get into that detail in a moment. And then compiled all deliverables into a final folder that could survive our work for anybody else who comes after us. And that completes this final stage of explaining simply. So let's go into each one individually. If you go here to the bottom left, you'll see a recording of a tutorial walkthrough of this dashboard. This was created for the presenters. So a very big chunk of the survey was about collecting feedback about what people thought of each individual presenter, how they did when it came to the content they presented and the depth of the content they presented. There was also open-ended information. On the left, you will see two charts. The overall average, so this does not change from dashboard to dashboard. This is what across all presenters, people thought about the content. And then for any one individual presenter, how they performed. So this is an example of Rand, Rand was one of the presenters at the event, a well-known national speaker from Moz. This is what people thought about his presentation relative to everybody else that presented. On the far right is the depth of his presentation relative to everybody else that they attended. And what you'll see in the middle are all the open-ended responses. So this is any open-ended feedback. Just tell us what you thought, your own words. And you can scroll through that. So there's a quick tutorial that walks you through using this dashboard. Dashboards are great, they have a purpose, but Rand himself might look at this once or twice, but after that, he's never gonna look at it again because even if this was updating in real time for every speech he gave across the country, at some point it's gonna converge on the predictive values and he will no longer find any insight from it and he'll stop looking at it. And this is true of a lot of dashboards. Dashboards in particular have a huge churn problem. People sign up for them, they get a bunch of value from them early on, Nothing changes over time and they unsubscribe. And that's because this cannot be the end of your analytical process. You may need these dashboards, but you need other analytical insights as well. The next deliverable that we created, you can go to this link and download this sheet itself. So this is the customer journey map for DMC for the annual event from awareness through consideration to purchase to retention to growth. So all the 20-ish variables that we use have been organized by those stages. We use that framework to guide the analysis. The journey map is perfect for organizing multiple variables in an easy to understand way. You do not have to be a data scientist to look at this and understand everything that's happening leading up to the event, during the event, and after the event. It captures everything about competitors. It has clear recommendations at the bottom. Anybody in the organization can download this one sheet, look at it, and get a pretty good sense of what is going on and what needs to happen in the future. That is also true of the Pareto persona. So this is a picture of Vilfredo Federico Damaso Pareto, the man behind the original Pareto principle. We use him just as a template to hold the picture and the name or something the organization can go on later and correct. But the 20%, the one in five customer who attends this event that has 80% of the value has a lifetime value of $760. So this is, if you had tweeted between 750 and 770, you would have won a sword. The purpose of creating this kind of deliverable is to put a face on that individual group. Everything about their learning goals, which is important to the event, their membership status and DMC beyond the actual attendance at the annual events their loyalty, their customer journey, their gender, their age, their type of expertise, all of it's summarized in a sheet that you can print out and put up on the wall. 
this needs to be updated over time. But once this exists, it can guide the marketing team, the sales team, the product team, the CX team. There are many personas possible. This one always exists. You take the top quintile, the top 20% of revenue or value or profit, and you put a face on them. And then you take this sheet and you make it available to everybody in the organization. And you can go download this here in the bottom left. But again, it is a perfect way to express. There's 20 something variables expressed in this one sheet. Now, as great as a journey map is, as great as a persona sheet is, there's too much information from this study to summarize in those two single deliverables plus the dashboard. And so this gets to the final report. There is a fierce debate in academia about how to best express ideas. So on the one hand, there's the traditional academic paper, hundreds of pages, everything sourced and cited, table of contents, it's all written language. But it's something that an expert, a peer, could look through and say, yes or no, this is good or not. And a lot of organizations will follow that approach when it comes to creating their final deliverable. I personally believe that it is not the right way to go because most people are visual learners. So the other approach that's often pursued, and this is where the defense department and certain organizations, high level consulting organizations, they create decks. And if you can create the killer deck, it's all green lights for you because you have figured out a way to express complex ideas in easy to understand ways. These are often highly visual, but their weakness is that they are dependent on you being there to see the presentation. And if you're not there to see the presentation, you might not get as much from it as you would from a written report. And there's actually a beautiful middle ground that exists between them, which is you create that deck and you create that visually rich report and then you record the actual presentation, which is half of it. And now if you weren't there, you both get the visual impact of learning through that, but you also get hearing the human voice over it and everything that related to it. And this just requires that your deliverable is both the deck and the recording. So I said earlier, record everything. This is why. If you follow this approach, you will create something that anybody can relate to. And it doesn't matter if they were there or not. And they're going to actually consume it where if it's a 100-page written report, they're just not going to. And so the effectiveness of explaining simply is realized with this hybrid approach. But I also said that organization is key. So at Imperitas, we have this benchmark rule, 30 seconds. You're gonna create smart goals and secondary research sheets, qual and quant interview instruments. You'll have data files and audio recordings and analytics code and journey maps and personas and lifetime value reports and recordings of those reports. There is a mass of material that supports everything that you have done. If someone else cannot go into that material and within 30 seconds find what they are looking for, it is not organized well enough. And the last step in this kind of project is creating an organizational structure for all of this material that anybody could jump into and because it has clear identification in the folders and subfolders and file names, they could quickly find what they are looking for. And the benchmark really is 30 seconds. It doesn't sound like a lot, but if you have to stand there with somebody who's looking through their files for 30 seconds to find something, it feels like an eternity. If you can do that, you have effectively created a system that will outlast you. And this is very important. This is probably the biggest issue facing any research project, any data science project out there. Does it depend on the individual who did it or does it depend on the processes behind it? And so at Imperitas, we use this term, it's from Agile. What is the truck factor of every individual? Meaning, if that person got hit by a truck, what happens to the sustainability of the project? If it goes to zero, meaning that that person gets hit by a truck and the project's done, they have too high of a truck factor. And you need to be thinking about creating systems that can survive any one individual. So no one should be able to have a truck factor that high because that's what's important to the sustainability of the organization. Having file structures and folder structures where everything is available is an important component to that. But you have to build this in from the beginning. So as you're thinking about SMART goals, this is why you assign directly responsible individuals so that you can get them to turn all of their information over to the project so that 
if they're hit by a truck, it doesn't sink the entire project. And there is a secondary benefit to having this level of both organization and focus when you're creating your project. It's because it allows you to scale it year over year. We are going to do this work again in 2019 for DMC, without a doubt. We've been working with them since 2015. And every year, the depth of information we can provide goes deeper and deeper and deeper because we do not have to recreate every single thing. Because we have created scripts and surveys and qualitative interviews that can be redone if they're given minimal update because the assumptions that they were based on have changed. Reproducibility, in the end, is the ultimate benchmark. Yes, can you find things in 30 seconds? Can it survive somebody who gets hit by a truck? Both of those things mean that you can reproduce the work moving forward. And if you do that, then you as an organization will be able to use lifetime value to continually improve the customer experience and drive profitability for yourself. So let's recap where we've been today. Then we'll take questions. We've defined lifetime value and all of its components. I've explained its use cases and its common pitfalls, and I've shown you a fully worked example with links to materials that you can go download and recreate yourself. Your learning does not have to stop here. This is a great article where I took the title of this presentation from the only metric that matters. This is from a CEO of a data of an ETL data company. So this is people who help break down silos and get data into their usable form. But the basic idea is that lifetime value is, again, that profit that you can generate over time and that to do this effectively, you have to break down these data silos. If today was too deep, if you feel like you've been drinking from a fire hose, stop, go watch this other one hour video that Imperitas produced about a year ago, where we really covered this topic at a much higher level. Watch that, take a nap, come back, go through these slides and this presentation today, and you will be on your way to producing a lifetime value metric for your organization.